This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. There's an alarm that's going to go off if somebody gets too close. Um, okay. Uh, <sighs> this was one of those secrets that eventually wanted out to tell Chelsea that she had a, a sibling. And I did it spontaneously. I didn't prepare for it. I just like, I think I was watching television or something like that. Something maybe on the screen may have triggered this, but uh, I, I said to Chelsea, you know, you're... You have a half-brother in Germany. I, I didn't get upset. I was just like, okay, you need to tell me. But he went like this. He, he flinched a little bit to like cover his head. No, you, could just, you just have to tell me. I just want to know. Like, I'm not mad or anything. I just, I didn't know that there was another brother. When my dad told me on my way to college, I wasn't upset because it explained, it, it helped give me all the answers to things that I was like either guessing about or it answered the whole... I have something to tell you when you're old enough to understand. I didn't get upset because it was all in the past and I was fine, physically unaffected. You know, I had everything I needed. There was no reason for me to be upset. This was something that was in his past. And I also knew that this was not easy for him to share. Again, even though he's unemotional sharing it, uh, I know inside that he is, it's, it's hard to to tell somebody the truth about yourself and tell them that you've been lying to them. But I think this is where I realize I have so much more empathy than I realized because I constantly try to put myself in the other person's shoes, not just with my dad, but with everybody in my life, everybody that I come across. I think about how you are going to receive me. That started early on. That stuck with me. And so I still do that with everybody today. It just helped everything make sense. And so I knew that this was emotionally probably the, one of the harder things he's done in his life is to share that he had not been totally honest about who he was to his own kid. So for him to tell me, oh, you have a brother. Oh, no, 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 it's a German brother. And then to flinch while he's telling me just goes to show you that it was not easy for him to share. I mean, he waited to tell it. I think that was shame and I think that was maybe he wasn't sure how I was going to react because I reacted okay the first time, but maybe this time it would be different. You never know how somebody's going to react, no matter how well you know them. That was another thing that happened, another statement that was made that changed my life again because I had not expected that she would uh, latch on to that and and go search for her half-brother, like a maniac. She didn't even share that with me. So it was like immediate, like, I need to know everything. And I'm gonna start looking, and he's just like, good luck. You know, he didn't think that I was gonna find him. And I said to myself too, I was like, if my dad and my brother is anything alike, my brother's gonna be hard to find. From Imperative Entertainment, I'm Alden Ehrenreich. This is The Agent. I was on a one-way street. I needed to go to the United States. She could not be allowed to interfere with that. There was no turning back. It was clear that I was going to become Henry Van Randall. Soviet troops were all over the place in Afghanistan today. Neither the American people nor I will support sending an Olympic team to Moscow. They were afraid that Ronald Reagan might want to accelerate the end of the world. To ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I created for myself an artificial dual personality. I had two of them. The spy job got in, in the way of my real job. I knew that the FBI would never find me. I had a dream one night. I think I need to look for him again. I need to find him. Chapter 11, Brother, My Brother. I knew it was gonna be difficult to find him and I had very little information. I only had his full name 
and I knew that his mother's name, and I had an approximate birth date, an approximate age, and I knew that he was born in Berlin, but that's it. And I'm looking for somebody named Matthias, which is a extremely common name, and the last name Dietrich, and another really common last name. I just knew I had to act fast because if I didn't, the, I would, I would, I knew I would just miss an opportunity. I just had a feeling I was going to look for him, and he was like, "Yeah, good luck." He didn't show any concern or any kind of like emotional. He didn't show any kind of like anxiety about it. But I didn't really care about that because I was only interested in trying to see if I can find him. I know my dad well enough to know that he is on the exterior. He presents himself as somebody who is in full control of himself in terms of his emotions. He presents himself as somebody detached from his emotions, but he's deeply emotional. And you have to kind of like crack that exterior to know that. And I'm the same way, so being vulnerable has to be a thing, and it's really hard to do. <laughs> so I'm looking for this guy. I looked everywhere I could think. I'm like, let me start with Facebook, and I was like, no, that's not going to work. I did have a friend who was a German exchange student who is still a great friend of mine. Uh, she lives in Hamburg. When I was a freshman in high school, that's when I met her, and we stayed in touch. And I asked her for advice. I was like, I don't know where to look. And she goes, Oh, we have this like equivalent of Facebook in Germany. It's called Mein First、uh, Set, so Mein VZ. So she told me about this, and this is where I started my search. The first day, log in, create my profile, and I type in Matthias Dietrich. Okay, this is going to be a challenge because I just found like 300 of them. And I looked through every profile.、So、a lot of them didn't have photos. I had given up after some months. The only other way I could possibly do this is if I find his mom. And I knew that that would not be a good way to go because number one, I knew she didn't speak English. And yes, you know my German language skills at the time were I could get away with like writing back and forth, but in in、uh, person there was no way to communicate. I just knew it was out of question to even try to get a hold of her, just based on the nature of what happened.、Um, my dad just disappeared, and she assumed, she was told that he was dead. Right, so they declared him dead after like ten, eleven years in Germany. Like she assumed that he was dead, so I knew that that was not a good route. I thought I need to find a kid first, and then maybe see if there's even a possibility I could talk to him. If he's even willing to talk to me, then maybe one day we can get to that point. But I just didn't want to rock the boat, I guess, because that would really shatter somebody's world. And of course, the reaction there towards me would probably not be very good. I had no clue. I had only known that the last time my dad had seen him was Matthias was about seven or eight years old, and that was it. I had given up because I was like, I don't really know if there's going to be a possibility of finding him. I was like, let me just figure this out later. And then, I literally seven or eight months later had a dream. One night, I was in my apartment in Lancaster, Pennsylvania.、I、had a dream, and I woke up at like two, three a.m. I think I need to look for him again because this is really like starting to be unsettling for me. Like I, I need to find him. I woke up. I'm like exhausted. I'm not a morning person at all. Waking up in the middle of the night's weird for me. On my laptop, I'm. Looking him up again in Google, and I'm trying to think of other ways aside from going to Germany to find him. And another search result popped up that hadn't been there before, and it was from the Free University of Berlin. It had a Free University of Berlin profile CV for somebody named Matthias Dietrich, who was finishing up his PhD for pharmacology. So he's a pharmacist, and I was like, hmm. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. My dad was a chemist. This is pretty close. This guy's in Berlin. Same name. Okay, I think I'm onto something. So I click on it, and I just see everything I needed to see: contact information, full CV, just enough information for me to know that's him. I saw the picture, and I was like, "He looks exactly like my dad. Young version of my dad, but with much blonder hair." 
that's without a doubt that's my brother there's no way the only thing was so i'm looking through this page i'm like in awe i'm like oh my gosh yes this is perfect he's so much like his dad he doesn't even know this i didn't think about what do i do after i find him <laughs> all right well i know one thing i know he speaks english because of what he studies if you study any of the sciences anywhere in the world you have to know english that's just the way that works all right, so I'm going to write something to him in German, and I'm going to apologize to him. I just don't know how to start this conversation. <laughs> Let me just do this. Let me just say, just send him an email and just say, Hello, Matthias, and I wrote in German. I basically apologized to him in German. I said, hey, my German's not that great, so I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm just going to write the rest of this in English. So that was my attempt to connect to him before I hit him with this bombshell. And the question that I followed up with was, I'm looking for my brother, and I think you might be him. My question to you is, did you grow up with your dad? If you did, please ignore my message. He sent me an email back, I think, about eight or ten hours later. And it was a very cautious email. It was basically... Why do you think I might be your brother? And maybe we can confirm some information. I followed up with, if you are my brother, your mother's name is Gerlinda. He sent an email back. He gave me this big, this heavy disclaimer. I don't know if you have any idea what you're doing. This could be very dangerous. So that told me he knew who his dad was. He knew enough about what his dad had done. I told him I was looking for my brother, but I didn't tell him anything about me. I was just trying to see if he was it so that I could figure out a way to continue the conversation. So once we confirmed that he was the person by way of confirming who his mom is, he sent me an email saying, this is very dangerous and it's not child's play and that I don't know what I'm doing and that we should maybe not be in contact if this is still the case, if it was still going to be dangerous. And I responded, with no uh the fbi caught up with us everything is okay like i'm able to contact you because i now know about everything and we're safe so there's no danger for you or for me as far as i know and we should be able to have a conversation safely i was in calculus class at 8 a.m i'm sitting in there i have my blackberry and i like see an email pop up right at the start of class and I see on the subject line, it says, Dear little sister. And my eyes got really wide. I just remember feeling really flushed. And I was like, I have to leave and read this. So I got up and I just left. And my professor called me. Where did you go? You need to be in this class. This is a lot more important than your class right now. I'm sorry. I'll explain later. <laughs> I shared a photo after the dear little sister email. He had expressed that he had no interest in reconnecting with his dad. He was only interested in getting to know his sister. And then I told him, oh, by the way, you have another sibling. <laughs> so I sent him a picture of both of us. And so the conversation was just about our lives and who we are as people, what we like, what we don't like, have we traveled, things like that. And because my brother was wrapping up his PhD and about to defend his thesis in like late December, he sends me an email and he says, hey, I have a week in January where I don't really have anything going on. I can fly in for a weekend and come and see you. I'm coming to see you. I was freaking out because this happened fast. I had only told my dad up to that point, I found him, and my dad sent an email back and he said, now what? What do you mean, now what? I'm emailing him. Like, what do you mean? But, um, but my dad stayed out of it. <laughs> he was like, not, not really, he didn't ask me questions. He was just like, oh shit, she found him. I'm sure he was thinking, well, what if he, what if he wants to meet me? What if he wants to, to like chew me out about this? Matthias was on his way to America. He told Chelsea he only wanted to see her and Jesse. He wanted nothing to do with his father. Chelsea was a bundle of nerves. She had no idea what to expect. 
She waited impatiently for her brother's plane to arrive. He flew in. He landed on a Friday evening. I was living in Lancaster, Pennsylvania at the time, and I picked him up from the Philadelphia airport. I remember in the airport waiting for international arrivals. I was there for two hours pacing. I have no idea what to expect for the next two days. No idea. I remember watching him walk out of the international arrivals and I spotted him right away and I was just like, oh my God. My thought went to the guy that was in that little picture from the, the website on, where his CV was posted on the Free University of Berlin is standing in front of me right there. I couldn't believe that. He looked very European, like he looked exactly like the picture, but he just, he looked just like, it was like a young version of my dad was walking towards me and it was just so crazy. I remember he was wearing those typical European sneakers. He was wearing like slim cut jeans. He was wearing a dark sweater. So he had a couple of bags with him and we, we stopped in front of each other. The first thing he says to me is, you are so American. <laughs> And then I hugged him, and then we just kind of we just stared at each other for a little bit, just like, cannot believe I'm standing right in front of my sibling. Okay, well, how was your flight? Are you hungry? Because it was getting to the evening time. We didn't eat much of anything at the restaurant because we were so busy talking. I remember telling the waiter at one point, we'll call you if we need you. I can't even explain to you like what this is right now. Just We'll call you if we need you. Can you just not come back? <laughs> so we were picking out our food, we were talking, and I was really surprised at how good his English was. He has the same language ability that my dad does to kind of lose the accent. When he's not using the English that often, of course, he, he, he sounds a lot more German, but I was very surprised at how well he spoke English, and, and it felt like, felt like a long-lost friend. I mean, that's my brother, you know, and it's, it's so crazy. We don't have the same mom. We didn't grow up in the same country. We only share the same dad, but he didn't grow up with that dad, okay? Yet, we are still so connected and still so much the same. I was so blown away by that. I wake up the next morning, so the plan was to take him around where I lived at the time and then show him the house that the FBI had caught up with uh, my dad in and Again, no, no interest in talking to dad here. I said I was going to show him my life, and that was the plan. Now I wake up and I see him sitting in front of me, just staring at me. And in any other scenario, that would have been really creepy. I felt the same way looking at him. I was like, I could only imagine he's sitting here like, my whole life has changed in an instant from this email that she sent me. This is my sister sitting in front of me. My whole life is not what I thought it was. I, I didn't know that I had family here. I, I had a feeling that he might be reconsidering the dad thing. And sure enough, a few minutes into a good morning conversation, I only have like another day here. And I think I would maybe want to meet dad, but you have to be there. I can't do this without you. I need you to be there. You can't leave my side. We have a favorite restaurant in New Jersey called the Clinton House. And it's a German-American uh, based restaurant. It's a great, great restaurant. They have prime rib there. There's like my favorite thing. It's like king cut prime rib. And that's all they put on that plate. And that's the only thing I ever ordered there. So I call my dad. Maybe he'll meet us at the Clinton House or something. So I call my dad. Um, so... Matthias is in my apartment with me and says that he wants to meet you. And my dad hangs up the phone. I'm sitting in the, in the house. I think I'm watching some TV. The phone, it's in the evening, early evening. Phone rings and Chelsea's on the, uh, on the line and says, Hey, Dad, uh, I'm here with Matthias. Why don't you come meet us? She persisted. I hung up. That, that's really really bad. <laughs> this is totally uncharacteristic. Uh, it, it was a really big shock. I didn't know how to handle it. I, I don't think it, I was, was saying anything with it. I just like, I had to find my center and 
figure out what next. He calls me back and he says, did you try to persuade him to do this? And I was like, no, absolutely not. He said that he wasn't ever interested in interacting with you, but he changed his mind. He hangs up again. He calls me back and he goes, okay, Clinton House at like seven or eight o'clock. Then I said, okay, I'm coming. And the reason for that was I hadn't told anybody what a coward I was in that respect. I made it clear to her, I said, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable uh, reconnecting with Germany, particularly with Matthias, because I sort of betrayed him. I, not sort of, I betrayed him. So, you know, when, when I'm talking about that, that I'm fundamentally fearless, I was afraid of meeting him. I was afraid of meeting his mother, and I just wanted to avoid that. And she forced my hand. I was afraid of my own guilt. You know, this is like opening a wound that you know is there, but uh, you figured you had it covered. This was part of my compartmentalization. I didn't, I didn't want to touch that part of my brain. Most people think of themselves as good. I'm not an exception. I always thought I was a really good person, but there, there was uh, something that made me not good. And I, I was, you know, I was emotionally not prepared to step into, into that realm. And Chelsea forced my hand. I never thought of him in, in a way like, I wonder what happened to him. I wonder who he is today. I didn't think of that. That one I just suppressed completely. When you're not there as a husband, as a, as a father, when you're not there when the child is born, you know, you don't have uh, the moments when you bond, right? And when you, when you don't see this little baby grow up and take the first steps and then say, da, 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 da. I had none of that. Well, I had a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks twice. It didn't go great. The first time I saw him, he was um, just about two years old and he was a very sickly child. And, and there was just no emotional connection. Chelsea, on the other hand, I carried out of the hospital. I saw her get up and stand and walk. There was a huge difference. I didn't think about Matthias a lot. I didn't miss him. He was just, he was just uh, an indictment of me hanging out there me hoping that that indictment would never materialize. And it actually didn't, but I didn't know that. The moment I could not tell the world that I'm driven by fear, I had to face the music. And it wasn't just to please Chelsea. This was a forcing move. And there's no way that I could live down not having gone. That would have been forever stuck with me. I knew this was going to be the reaction because I was like, he has no idea Macias is here right now. Like, of course he's going to be freaking out. And now I'm bringing his son that he hasn't seen in 30 years. I just, I was also very surprised that Matthias changed his mind that quickly. But we had talked for hours and hours and hours from the second he got off the plane. So I think he needed to see how we were going to interact with each other. And I think he needed to see me in person and what kind of person I am and how I talk about my life and how I talk about my dad. And I never pushed this on Matthias. I only told him some facts and I left it at that. I didn't say, oh, you need to meet him because of this. I know you don't want to talk about him, so we won't. That's fine. I'm not here to try to pressure you. The rest of that day, the plan was to show my brother um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, drive him around Amish country. The whole day, even though we were really excited to be like driving around and exploring together, we were very quiet. But I could feel how nervous he was. He was so like, I don't know the word to use, but he was just so, he was just quiet. He was in his head the whole day. And even though we were, oh, this is really cool. Let's take pictures of this. As soon as we said that, that part, that excitement was over because he was back to dad. I'm about to meet my dad. Every minute was like the longest minute of 
the day. And I remember we're leaving the house to go to New Jersey for this dinner. And we said almost nothing. I was, I was also nervous because I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how their meeting was going to go. I couldn't even guess at that point. I was nervous enough to meet him myself and worrying about the possibility of that going wrong. But I knew that the chances of that going really bad was not that high. I knew that it was more of a possibility that him and my dad meeting and our dad meeting again for the first time was, was going to be extremely tense and negative. I knew that the possibility was there for that to be awful. And I think that's why Matthias really wanted me to be there. I think he felt quickly that he could lean on me for that support. We, we got there early. I think we were there about 30, 40 minutes early. So we're just sitting in the car waiting. I told Matthias, I was like, we're not going to go into the restaurant yet. We're going we're gonna to wait until the agreed time. And my dad's never late. He's always on time or early. And by on time, I mean he's early. <laughs> so I knew 10 minutes before he was supposed to show up that he was going to show up. So around that time, I was like, all right, let's get out of the car and let's go walk to the front of the restaurant and just go stand there. He'll be here in the next couple of minutes. And I'll tell you which car he's pulling up in. So I see my dad pull up, go to the parking lot. That's, that's his car. Immediately, Matias is like tensed up. He's like straightening his posture. This is it, right? There's like no turning back now. Dad gets out of the car. He's walking, he has to cross the street to, to get to the restaurant. And at that point, I just kind of stepped, stepped out or checked out. I don't think there's anything I can say here. <laughs> he walks up, they shake hands, and they stared at each other for a good minute, looking each other up and down, and they said a couple of words. I see Matthias. And he stood there and he would, he stood there and looked at me for probably 30 seconds, just like this. The, the head tilted a little bit. He, he, I'm a little taller than him and he just looked at me. And then we went and had, had a meal and we started social interaction. They spoke in German quite a bit, which was weird for me because that was the first time I'd really heard him, my dad, speak German. And I knew his German was rough because he hadn't used it much, but I'm glad he spoke German because it, it really, I think it helped connect Matthias a little bit better. So there was some difficult conversation there that I missed because it was in German and I understood some of it, but I couldn't get all of it. I don't know all of the, the slang words. I didn't want to face the music. And, and the, the only one who wound up uh, making an indictment was my own self because Matthias was okay. So when I, uh, when I get it, had a chance, and it was not right at the beginning, but uh, towards the end, when I explained to him my situation, I still un I remember what he said. I understand. That was a big, big burden off of me. But it went well, and they kept it as light as they possibly could. Matthias had some questions, and my dad had some questions. The night continued once dinner was over. The three went back to Jack's home. My dad was not crazy about us going to the house because we have the whole family in the house, and we thought it might be, he thought it might be too much. And I think my dad was also nervous that more, more stuff was going to surface in front of the family. Jesse had not gone with Chelsea and Matthias to the restaurant. He stayed back at the house, and now he too would meet his brother. So we get to the house, and I don't think my brother came out of the room right away. <laughs> I think he waited a little bit. Everybody else said hi, and then my brother came down, and then they finally talked. And we had a lighthearted time. We're taking pictures. We're laughing. We're joking. We're sharing um, Matthias's pictures. We're, we're sharing the pictures that I have from our trip, and just he's getting to know the family. And when. Uh... We were settled in the house. 
I gave Matthias the rationale of why I did what I did. And so Chelsea uh, was the, the absolute key for me to reconnecting with Germany and uh, uniting the family that uh, has an ocean in between. Then everybody starts to go to bed. So we were in the living room, and my dad said, I have one really big question for you. And this I knew was going to be a difficult one, because the way he said it, it sounded like my dad was starting to get a little emotional. Now he feels safe enough that he can bring up something more serious. He said, the KGB promised me money. When I wrote that Dear John letter, they promised me that they would get that money to you and your mom. Did you guys ever get the money? And Matthias confirmed that they did get the money. That was a big source of relief for my dad because I saw my dad just kind of shrink. You could just see the, the depression from that just kind of come out of him because he had no idea. He had no way of knowing if they had delivered on their promise. I don't think my dad really intended to ever not be a family guy. After Matthias confirmed that we, uh, he did get, they did get the money, my dad, I think he teared up and I think he was starting to like cry a little bit. And then Matthias got very emotional. I had to turn away because I just could see the relief on my dad's face. I know that that had to have tortured him, not knowing if they delivered on the promise to him. While the first meeting went well, the healing was only beginning. Matthias told him, she waited for you for like 11 years. And so there is another difficult truth to face. You know, it's not that he has to face himself. He has to also face the consequences that come out of doing these people that are in his family so wrong. That's not easy. He told me that he really didn't miss me. Uh, he, and, and he told me that he, he doesn't think he's in any way, shape, or form, form damaged not having a father figure growing up. And I believe that that was rationalization. But I couldn't tell him, young man, you're wrong. That has to have been an impact. But uh, you know, that's how he processed. Though there was happiness in the reunion, the conversations were not easy. There was so much yet to be resolved from the past. I guarantee you there was an intellectual understanding. You know, we are similarly wired. He's a, he's a very bright guy, and he, he's more emotional than I am, but uh, he's a very, very rational, logical thinker, so he understood the dilemma that I was faced with. And I chose the one who needed me more. Now that is the rational uh, explanation. I didn't even go into the emotional aspect. That wouldn't have been right. Dad went to bed. Matthias and I were just sitting there in the living room. We just held each other and we cried. We were just like, we were crying. We were so overly emotional. But um, I was like, this is only the beginning. And, and, you know, whatever happens with you and Dad, that's fine. But, like, you're stuck with me. You're like, you can't go anywhere now. You're your family, so. It's not so easy to deal with the emotional consequences of the screw up. Not only do you have to face yourself, you have to face them too, and you have to find a way to make amends if you can. So here's three people, his son Matthias, his wife Gerlinda, and then mom. Mom added a question, she had already passed away. And that was another thing we found out in that meeting. Jack's life as an undercover agent had been hidden for so many years and was now fully revealed to Chelsea, Jesse, and Matthias. But he had abandoned a wife, a child, and a mother back home. And in many years of silence, they believed that the man they knew as Albrecht was dead. Gerlinda had not known the true fate of her husband when he did not return from his last mission in the United States. She believed for years that he would return. Going back to Germany to be with Gerlinda and Matthias may not have been the storybook ending that Jack had imagined. He pondered what his life might have been like 
if he had picked the other route. There isn't too much to speculate. This would have been this would have been a train wreck in many respects. So so here I am. I I come back to East Germany. It's 1988. I get a couple of months rest, and then the KGB is putting me back in action. Short term assignments, courier work. I mean, I was a a successful seasoned agent that you can send anywhere in the world and you can trust that he will execute on the operational aspect, for sure. That's a great asset to have, and on top of it, a German, not a Russian. So, you know, they could, I could travel with a West German passport all over the place. And most likely, we would have had a house, and maybe a second car, and all kinds of wonderful things. And then the wall comes down. I'm an agent for the KGB. They would have offered me to live in the Soviet Union. And at least what I remember initially, uh, Galinda was very positive. The, the alternative was like, what? What can I still do in this new Germany? And on, to- yeah, and on top of it, I don't know what the, what the East Germans would have done with me. They probably would have uh, allowed the CIA or the FBI to talk to me. I might have wound up in jail <laughs> after all. Finally. After so many years, Jack spoke with Gerlinda. Matthias had told his mother about his secret trip to the United States to visit the sister he had not even known about just a few months earlier. I had a phone call and conversation with her. She didn't, she didn't want to see me, she, but she talked to me on the phone for so maybe a half hour. And uh, of, of the half hour, she spent probably a good 20 minutes berating me. She was totally entitled. I mean, she probably could have spent the whole day. I just listened a lot. I don't know to what extent it makes a difference. I told her I left you because there was a child in need and a child that I loved. Well, and she also had a premonition that one time I might actually find another woman, and then she said, the one who's physically closer will win. And I tried to, I was adamant, I talked her out of it. There's no way, it's not gonna happen. And I meant it when I said that. And then she found out I'm still alive, Matthias told her. And she was angry with him. And it took uh, quite a while for them to, to have a normal relationship. She actually told Matthias, I forbid you to have an interaction with this, this man. And he, he turned around and said, you can't, that's my father, that's my decision. I felt more guilty having abandoned Kalinda than Matthias. There was emotional connection. And uh, we had the first separation when I moved to Moscow. That was heartbreaking. I never saw her again. She didn't want to see me. I still love that woman. You know, this was genuine. This was not, this, this was not fake. I was always looking for love, real love, right? And uh, I found it more often than I should have. After so many years, what would Jack say to her if he could see her again today? I'm sorry. I'm very, very sorry, because I, not only did I hurt you tremendously, but, uh, but I'm, I'm, I also, I was always proud of keeping my promises, and this one I broke, and that was the biggest one I had made up to that point in my life. There's nothing, there's nothing that I can say or do that uh, will wipe this guilt out. And that's it. You know, if you add any more verbiage, you, uh, you, you cheapen what you're trying to tell. Though Jack had reconnected with Matthias, he was not able to reconcile with Gerlinda. For her, the pain was too much. Matthias also told his father about someone else from the past. Albrecht Dietrich's mother. I was very 
full of guilt with regard to Galinda and, and emotional about it, I felt very little of the same with regard to my mother. And the reason for that is that we didn't have an emotional mother-son relationship. I know she had emotion, but she did believe in the lie to, till the very end. She knew that I was lost, and the last time she knew where I was, I was still in Kazakhstan. Part of me not uh, trying to get in touch with her was guilt. When I was okay with the FBI, I wouldn't have looked forward to reconnecting with her because I had lied to her. And she knew that I was the most honest individual she ever interacted with. She would always brag about how honest I was. His mother did care. She searched for him for years, desperately trying to find her son. As a last resort, she even wrote former leader of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, a letter. A letter Jack still keeps in his house. Esteemed Mr. Gorbachev, President of the USSR, first of all, I would like to express my great respect and I believe that I speak for all Germans of goodwill for your great deeds in support of world peace. We appreciate your steadfastness and skill to lead such a great multinational country as the USSR. The reason for this letter is rather uncommon. I am asking for your assistance in the search for my son, Albrecht Dietrich, born May 18, 1949, who started his assignment as chemist in space research in Kazakhstan in 1978. I have received no communication from him. In February of 1990, the German embassy in Moscow discovered that P.O. Box 841, which I use to address my letters, does not exist anymore. What is certain is that from 1975 to 76, he worked as a personal aide to the East German science attaché in Moscow. This is when he was recruited for the space research by a professor from the Lomonosov University. He passed a test and was chosen to prepare for duty at Intercosmos 77. He stated with certainty that in 1989 he would definitely return home. A mother goes through much suffering, days, weeks, months and even years without notice, without a reason for the silence. Your long reach is my last hope. And so I ask you again to find my son. I wish you and your people health, peace, and good fortune. Huta Reisman as the mother. If she's my mother, and, and, but there was no emotional attachment. So, of course, I cringed when, when, I had, when I read the letters. On a Russian TV show, she even had a friend ask the viewing public for help in finding her long-lost son. Sie lässt sogar in einer vermissten Sendung des russischen Fernsehens von einem Freund der Familie eine Suchmeldung verlesen. Ich suche Albert Dietrich. Ich habe von deiner Mutter Jutta L. den Auftrag bekommen, dir einen herzlichen Gruß zu übermitteln. Sie rechnet mit deiner Antwort. Deine Mutter wartet auf einen Gruß über das Moskauer Fernsehen Kanal 1. Spasibo. I am looking for Albrecht Dietrich. Your mother Huta R. asked me to convey her warmest greetings to you. She is expecting an answer from you. Your mother is waiting for a message via Moscow Channel 1. Uh, when I saw that TV program, it was 
very unpleasant and there was guilt in there. Chelsea had not known about the lengths that the grandmother she never met went to try and find her son until recently. Of, of all, like I'm getting chills and I'm like getting a little emotional thinking about it. It's um, of all of this, I'm pretty sure that that's probably his biggest regret. And that kills me because I know that that tortures him. And that, that emotional torture has manifested in other ways in his life. I did not know that he had those letters. I spent like a year and some months looking for my brother but I found him. She spent a lot more time looking for my dad. And she had to die with the knowledge that she would never be able to see or talk to him again. It's another one of those contradictions that I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely comfortable talking about it. It is not just a clinical exercise. There is a uh, still suppressed emotions um, and I don't know if I'll ever reconcile everything I don't think it's reconcilable all I can do is try to not mess up with the time that, that I have left on this earth though he struggled to come to grips with his past and those he had left behind something continued to pull at him something he hadn't felt in years he wanted to go back home. Next time, on the season finale of The Agent. Well, I, surely I'd spot if there was a Russian spy living next door to me. I don't think you would. As much as you want to actually claim that you know you're the you're the James Bond that never falls for him, even James Bond falls for. Him. You know, it's amazing, Jack. You and I would have killed each other if we had to. This is the ultimate game of chess. This is the ultimate game of, of diplomacy and of statesmanship. You're making decisions that will affect the world. And you're doing it without telling anybody about it. A certain lady would like to know something about the father of her child. Well, I knew who that was. Now I had a country again. That felt really good. I always calculate in my head, well, if this didn't happen, what would my life be? The Agent is a production of Imperative Entertainment in association with Windjoy and is created, written, produced, and edited by Jason Hoke. Narration by Alden Ehrenreich. Executive producers are Jason Hoke, Jack Barsky, and Alden Ehrenreich. Sound engineering and additional editing by Shane Freeman. Our original score by Joshua Kleeb. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. If you'd like to learn more about this story, make sure to read Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Entangled Allegiances as a KGB Spy in America by Jack Barsky. Have questions? Email us at podcast at imperativeentertainment.com. If you love this show, tell your friends and leave us a positive review. Thanks again for listening.